Uh, well, welcome to New Life Church. Again, good morning, and, and welcome to all our Facebook Live listeners. Uh, I want to say hi to them. You know, we've been having like anywhere between three and 600 Facebook views uh, on our morning messages every week, so that's, that's pretty awesome. So good morning to all our Facebook uh, followers this morning. Uh, hey, I want to show you a picture uh, that won't mean a lot to a lot of you, but some of you here, like my relatives here for the family reunion, might mean something to you. So go ahead and put that picture up, if, if you would. Uh, now, does anybody recognize that piece of ground? Some of you do. Okay, some of you don't. That's, it's in Fairfield, about a block and a half straight north of the church, right where we're standing right here. And that little piece of real estate, that old broken up concrete that's getting overgrown with grass and weeds, uh, is probably, it's, it's a very significant piece of real estate in, in my life. That's because for all my growing up years, that's uh, where my grandma and grandpa's house stood. Grandma and Grandpa, uh, Sterling and Mabel DePrato. Anybody remember the DePratos? Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, that's my, uh, my grandparents on my mom's side. And I mentioned we're having a family reunion, so I was kind of thinking about that. Um, but, and, and a lot of the, a lot of the us cousins were uh, over there this, this week during the family reunion, like walking on this old concrete pad where the house used to be. And there were so many memories, like, well, I remember this, where this happened. And I remember where this happened. And, and uh, one of our cousins uh, pointed to where there used to be a, like a white fence uh, with one by four or one by six, uh, you know, white painted boards. Like, yeah, that's the one we had to replace every summer because when we play football, we'd crash through it. And then dad would take us by the ear to the lumber yard and we'd have to go buy the one by fours and come back and, you know, put them back up. And, and uh, so a lot of significant memories. And I, and I have those too, but I, I wanted to talk to you not so much about a significant memory, although it is a memory for sure, but it was more of one of the, the greatest moments of spiritual formation in my life happened on that piece of ground right there when there was a house there. And you can kind of see the, the sidewalk leading up to what would, would have been the front door there. And then you walked in the front door and right there was the living room. I mean, like you walked right into the living room. And right by the front door was a, this big overstuffed chair. Grandma and Grandpa, I still can see this couch. That a big couch and overstuffed chair that were blue. And uh, I remember a night... Uh, in late fall, maybe. It was when it got dark early. And uh, I was maybe 10 or 11 years old. And I uh, was there with my mom. We were just hanging out at my grandma's one night. I don't know. We'd stop there a couple times a week and, you know, whatever. And I, I was one of those kids where, I mean, sometimes if I had cousins there, I'd go play. But I was one of those kids that liked to kind of hang out and listen to the adults visit. I was one of those pain in the rump kids. My parents would go, don't you have some, go play. It's like, no, I want to listen to you guys. <laughs> and well, we don't want you to hear. <laughs> uh, anyway, but it's one of these nights, just whatever, just hanging out with my grandma and grandpa, Sterling and Mabel's. Um, I was 10, 11 years old. And uh, uh, so I was sitting there and my mom and grandma and grandpa and, I, and, and Aunt Chucky. I have an Aunt Chucky. It's not Uncle Chucky, which <laughs> what you would think. It's Aunt Chucky, because her, her name is Charlotte, uh, but Charlotte, Charlie, Chuck. So I, I, don't, I think from probably early on, she was Chucky, and we've never known her anything else than Chucky. So anyway, Aunt Chucky is sitting across the living room. I'm sitting in the big blue overstuffed chair right by the front door, and uh, it's maybe 7 o'clock, 7.30 at night, it's pitch dark outside. And uh, so we're sitting there visiting, and there's a knock on the door. Knock, knock, knock. And so my grandpa gets up and goes over the door and opens the door. And just as he's going to open the door, Chucky yells, Daddy! Because that's what they called their dad. They still, you know, to this day, he's Daddy. She said, Daddy! And she was quiet as he opened the door. And uh, I think it was the paper boy selling Grit, the Grit magazine. Anybody that old remember Grit? <laughs> you have to be really old to remember that. So Clayton Watts there to collect his 25 cents for the week for Grit. And, and so Grandpa you know, gives him his quarter, and he shuts the door and, and sits down. And, and Aunt Chucky's like, Daddy, what were you thinking? He's like, oh, it's the paper. Daddy, that could have been somebody with a gun. And you open the door, and he put that gun in your chest and pull the trigger. 
you see, this, you got to remember, it's like, it seems like overreacting and maybe a little bit, but this was like back in the early 70s and when like news was, you know, a lot more available and there was a lot of all the muggings. We didn't hear about muggings like when I was a little kid, but like in the 70s, you heard about people getting mugged and, you know, all the cr rampant crime. And so it was on people's minds. You know what I'm saying? And... Um, and, you know, I kind of grew up a little bit of a fraidy cat myself, too. And I remember my second grade teacher saying, Mike, you worry too much. <laughs> you know you worry when your second grade teacher tells you you worry too much. <laughs> so I was kind of a fraidy cat, and I, I think, obviously, it's in our DNA, and, <laughs> except for my grandpa. But anyway, so my aunt was just like, Daddy, what were you thinking by opening that door? And Because that could have been... They could have stuck a gun in, in your chest and pulled the trigger. What you don't know. And my grandpa was just so calm and cool. Uh, he, that's how I always knew him. I think that's because of the way he always was. And he was a strong believer, strong Christian, really a stable. Uh, he wasn't a lifelong Christian. He came to Christ before I came along. But, uh, so he, would, he didn't grow up in that. But, but God did a work in his life, and Jesus became real to him, and Jesus was his Savior. So anyway, and he just turned around and goes, what? What's the big deal? He said, so I open the door, somebody puts a gun and pulls the trigger. I'm in heaven. I mean, I'm seeing Jesus face to face. Is that a problem? I mean, he was just very so calm and cool. And I remember just dis, it was just disarming my aunt. She's like, oh. <laughs> and I just remember that... That struck me so much because I remember even as a 10 or 11 year old kid, I'm like, I, I want to be like that. I want to have that mindset that when scary things happen, when, when someone knocks at the door and something's not good, I want to have that calm, I want to have that peace. And I want to have that mindset like, it's okay. It's going to be okay. There's nothing to worry about here. God's got it. And that has always stuck with me. Now, I had been saved at Bible camp right before that. So it wasn't like I needed to get saved. I was saved, but I guess I didn't really understand all the benefits of salvation. You know, I just thought, you know, salvation was you don't go to hell and you get to go to heaven, which is true. <laughs> but, but there's a lot more to salvation than that, right? It's about living in a life of peace and joy and all that stuff in this world and, and also eternal life, right? Um, but I just remember, because kind of being a fraidy cat, it's like, wow, I, I want to be like my grandpa. And he was a smart guy. He was a bookkeeper, accountant guy. And, and there was lots of things I could have wanted to be like my grandpa. But that moment, and it didn't really, I mean, it hit me at that moment. But I, I've never been able to really forget that moment on that piece of ground. I can tell you exactly right where I was sitting, and I will never forget it because that was so attractive to me. Like, I want to have that kind of faith. I want to be able to, when anything comes at me, it's like, it's good. God's with me, man. He's got it. We're okay. So we're going to talk about that today because of those of you who attend kind of regularly, you know we're in a sermon series on the book of Colossians. And the name of the sermon series is Black and White in a World of Gray. And uh, where the title for that came from is Paul wrote to the, to the, the people of Colossae, the Colossians, and uh, he, had, he hadn't been there, but he, but he knew of them. And he knew that they were amazing. They were amazing Christians. They had the word and they were living it out and they were doing a great job. Uh, but uh, like a, at a lot of the churches in the first century, false teachers begin to come in with their own agenda and whatever their own deal. And, and, and had just bad teaching. And, and so Paul knew that was happening. So he wrote to them to really kind of encourage them and just remind them of some truths. And so he just laid it down in black and white. So just in, in uh, four chapters there in Colossians, a very short letter he wrote to them, the a book in the Bible, um, it just really lays out the gospel message in black and white. And we need that in black and white because people were coming into that first century church and trying to kind of muddy the waters, make things gray. And the gospel message is, is pretty black and white. But men, and when I say men, I mean people, mankind, 
uh, for 2,000 years have been muddying the waters of the gospel message. They've been turning what's black and white into gray. And it shouldn't be gray. And people like things in black and white, but we sure live in a lot of gray in this world. And it's like, well, I don't know if this is right or that's right. And Paul says, here's, here's, here's where it is. And so that's what I, I really appreciate about the, uh, the letter to the Colossians. Uh, because it's just, it just lays it out. And we've been working our way through the book of Colossians. And so today we're in chapter 3. Just the first two verses is uh, our text for today. Colossians chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you can turn there or you're punch your app on your phone. We also have them up on the screen for you. So Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 says, since then, and remember he's talking to believers, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Our default mode as humans, I think, is, is to set our minds on earthly things. Right, because we're we're actually we're this body is made of earth, right? <laughs> I mean, and this it's it's going to turn to earth again, but but we're, but we're we're we are eternal beings. We're not just a body. We have a soul. Uh, we're spiritual beings. We, we're spirit. We have a soul, which is our mind, will, intellect, emotions. This body is is temporary. It's a temporary tent. We're going to get uh, you know a, a permanent one eventually. But it's so easy just to focus on the natural and what we see with our eyes and hear with our ears in the natural realm instead of focusing more, more on the spiritual realm. That's, that's not our default mode. We have to really kind of change the way we think. And, and actually, Paul said that in the letter he wrote to the Romans, which is uh, something I've, I've tried to do all my life. It's, uh, Romans 12.2 says, um, the, just the, the first part of it says, do not conform to the pattern of the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What Paul's saying is you have to think different because as, uh, when we pass from death to life, right? When we, as believers, when we believe and receive eternal life, we have to think about things differently because now our spirit comes alive. And now we're not just living sort of in our earthly mode, we're, we're spiritual beings, and our spirit now is connected with the Holy Spirit, but we need to tune into that. You understand what I'm saying? We need to, like, connect with that. I mean, it's a reality whether you connect or not if you're a believer, but, but so many Christians don't really connect with that. They're not, because they've not renewed their mind. They haven't changed their thinking. So we, we think in earthly terms, but yet the, the greater truth is really heavenly terms, spiritual terms. Does that make sense? I hope so, because it's true. <laughs> so, um, what I, I couldn't put into words when I was 10 or 11, but really what I realize now after reading Romans 12 too, it's like, I wanted the transformation of the mind like my grandpa had. I wanted to be able to think like my grandpa. I want to have that mindset like my grandpa. Because his mind was set on heavenly things. Remember Paul said to the Colossians, to the Colossians, Colossians. That's the intermarried. It was a mess, I'm telling you. <laughs> Those Galatians who bewitched you, right? You need to marry the Colossians. They'll straighten you out. So <laughs> the Colossians. So he, write, he writes to them. Um, uh, well, now I lost my whole train of thought. Anyway. <laughs> um, to... Uh, to get them to, to uh, just understand, to get this is where it is. Because we drift off, and, and, and oh, he said, uh, I want you to have an, uh, a heavenly mindset. I want you to think of things above, not earthly things. Because what's our default mold? Think of earthly things. He says, you got to think of spiritual things. You got to change the way you think. You, you got to get your head in the game. Remember that? I did high school sports, right? And how many times does the coach say, Mike, get your head in the game. And I, I didn't take that bad. I was like, okay, yeah, because I was drifting because there's like a pretty girl in the stands. Oh, she's so good. Oh, get, oh, yeah, right? Because we, we drift, don't we? And we think we just get caught off on things we see or hear or whatever. And, and there's like, a, there's another reality going on. Like, where's your head? <laughs> My dad said that a few times. Where's your head, man? I don't know. I lost it. I'm a kid, right? I don't, I don't know what my excuse is now. But. 
Uh, so, so how do we, how do we change our thinking um, to get that transformation? Right? How, what do we need to? How do we need to think to have that heavenly mindset, that spiritual mindset? How do we not focus on things of the earth? Okay. Now we have to deal with things of the earth. Don't hear what I'm not saying. We have to deal with things on the earth, right? But we don't want to get bogged down and think that's the only reality going on because there's a whole another spiritual reality going on in the heavenlies that we don't see, at least with our natural eyes. The Bible says we can see it with the, the eyes of our heart, but we don't see it with our spiritual eyes. So how do we do that? Well, here's, there's probably lots of ways. I, there's three here I have for you today. Here's number one. When we live with a kingdom mindset, we understand that we are currently citizens of heaven. We're currently citizens of heaven. You're like, uh, that would be bad because that means I'm dead. Well, um, not necessarily. But let, let me read, just so you know what I'm, I'm, this is not my opinion. This is what the Bible says. Philippians 3.20 says, but we, talking to believers, we are citizens of heaven. Right? So I don't know how that could be more clear. He didn't say you will be citizens of heaven when you die. He's talking to people who are alive, physically alive. He said, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. We are currently citizens of heaven. Doesn't the Bible say that clearly? Yes, it does say that clearly. We're citizens of heaven. It was like, well, don't I have to be dead to be a citizen of heaven? Well, apparently not. Because he was speaking to people who are alive, including you today. You, you are a citizen of heaven right now. Yeah. And, and that's part of that renewed thinking. I remember for so many years of my life, even many years as a, a pastor, um, I kind of relegated anything good in the Bible about like heaven and the kingdom of heaven and all, I kind of relegated anything good to like, to like heaven, like eternal heaven, like after I physically die or Jesus comes back, whatever happens first. Okay, so even like the Lord's Prayer, which, you know, growing up in the Lutheran church, I prayed every week. And so I don't know, I, I, I did the math once. I don't know how many thousands of times I calculated I would have prayed the Lord's Prayer. Powerful prayer. Jesus taught us to pray that, Right. And it's recorded in Matthew 6, 10. The, the, well, the ver it's, it's more than 6, 10. But here's the verse that I said a thousand times in my life, never got until a few years ago. And it's this. It's like when Jesus teaches us to pray, he says, Say, pray this. Your kingdom come. So God's kingdom, right? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, when I was younger, growing up, and even through a lot of my adult years, it's like, yeah, your kingdom come, right? When Jesus comes back and he sets up his millennial kingdom in Jerusalem, which he's going to do, right? God, we understand that. So when he comes back, his kingdom come and his, his will will be done. All right? So well, I guess we're supposed to pray for him to come back, which we are. But, but what I didn't realize, this, this is, is like a current prayer. Like the kingdom, <laughs> when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, when he was physically here, walked the earth, what did he preach? Mm, this is, okay, I got to say this right. Jesus came to save, first and foremost, right? He said, I came to seek and save the lost. But he didn't say, I come preaching salvation. He did that. He said, I come preaching the kingdom of heaven. Look it up. The most, the most times he referred to what he came to do, I, 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 I'm, I'm bringing the kingdom. I'm preaching the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. We use those interchangeably. And what he said is, he said, when you see the Son of Man, who's Jesus, so he's talking about himself, when you see me casting out demons, you'll know that the kingdom of heaven is here. So is the kingdom of heaven here? Yes. I mean, this is not like heaven, right? Like eternal heaven. This is not paradise. But the kingdom of heaven is here. And Jesus said, don't look, you know, physically for the kingdom because the kingdom's in you. Now, the kingdom is in us now, in all believers, so the kingdom of heaven is here. The rule and reign of Jesus Christ is here in our hearts, and, and it spreads as, as, you know, as believers spread that. 
And there is going to be a future time where there will be, where there will be a physical kingdom of heaven on earth. The, the kingdom of Jesus will be here. It's not here yet. And there's going to be a time when there's perfection, no more death, no more sorrow, no more tears, no, 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 none of that stuff. That's coming, all right? We don't ha have that now. But, but when we think of all that good stuff, we just tend to like just kind of wait it out. You understand? Like sometimes like what so many Christians do is like, well, life pretty much stinks now. It's hard. The earth is going to hell in a handbasket. I uh, sure hope the rapture gets here quickly because uh, things are getting pretty bad. So we just like sit in a corner and grind it out, hoping Jesus comes soon. That is not what Jesus wants. He's coming back for a radiant bride. Doesn't the Bible say that? The bride is the church, which for me as a guy, I struggle with, but I'm good. I'm figuring if, if women have to be sons of God, I guess I can be a bride. <laughs> so the church, which is all believers, right? True believers, is the bride of Christ. He's coming back for a radiant bride, not some bride who's hovered in the corner going, it's about time you got here, right? So we're, ca we're called to expand the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God on earth. So we're, as believers, we don't just grind it out until the rapture or until our physical death. We are to be expanding the kingdom of God in our sphere of influence. So when we pray the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as, his will to as it is in heaven, we're actually supposed to be conduits of God's power bringing the will and the power of heaven to our little spot on the earth. We should be making our place on earth look more like heaven. It's not heaven, I understand that. But we're supposed to be expanding the kingdom and making it look more like heaven. And we gotta, we gotta understand um, that that's, that's how we're operating because we are currently citizens of heaven. We don't wait till we die to become a citizen of heaven. We're currently a citizen of heaven. So it kind of leads to point number two here, which is this. When we live with a kingdom mindset, we live from a position of power and authority. Okay, so we live from a position of power and authority. This is a really tr a tricky concept to preach because people, there, there are people kind of on both sides, uh, kind of polar opposites, of this truth of the Bible that kind of, again, muddy the water. Um, you have some people like, uh, they think all the power and authority is like just them. It's like, no, it's God's power working through you, okay? Some people don't get that. There's other people, uh, good, well-meaning Christians, who like think it's like prideful and almost, almost sacrilegious to think that there, any, any kind of power could work through them. Oh, who do you think I am? God? I'm not God. God's God. It's like, yeah, but he's working like through you. Like there should be power flowing through us. God's power from heaven through us to earth. That's why when we pray for the sick, he, he, he says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. We, we don't beg God. Oh, God, this is not evil or necessarily wrong to beg God to heal somebody, but but really, when you look at what the disciples did, how did they pray healing? In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. You will never read about a disciple begging God to heal somebody. They walked in the power and authority that God told them to walk in, where his power and authority was flowing through them from heaven to earth to the little spot on the earth, and they could, they could command things in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, and stuff happened. And it should happen that way. 1 Corinthians 4.20 is something, so many Christians miss this one. I don't know why. I did for a lot of years. For the kingdom of God, is the kingdom here now? Yes. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Oh, wouldn't that be nice if the church got this? Because what do we like to do? Ebity, 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 ebity. I've said this before, and I'm going to keep saying it. This is, again, don't hear what I'm not saying. Sometimes in church, the last thing we need is another Bible study. 
<laughs> oh, I saw some heads bop. Okay, I'm not, we need to study the Bible. We need to be in the Word. You need to know the Word of God. It needs to be in here. You need to be in the Word of God. Sometimes, and I've done this, we use another Bible study as a salve to sort of heal the hurt from actually not going out and doing it. In other words, instead of like actually going out and taking the kingdom of heaven to earth and walking in power and authority to see people saved and healed and delivered and discipled, instead of doing that because we're too, too much of a fraidy cat to do that or we think we don't, not equipped or I don't know if God wants it done, he'll do it himself. Like, no, he's called us to do it. So in order to kind of soothe that hurt, well, let's have another Bible study. And so people gather in their little Christian ghetto and have their little Bible study instead of actually going out and doing it. Okay, again, I am not saying don't have a Bible study. You should have a Bible study. You need to know the word. But don't use it as an excuse not to go do anything. I'm busy having a Bible study. It's like telling your kids, go clean up your room. And you come back later, they didn't clean up their room. Well, we, you know, I had some friends over and we're talking about what, really what, what you meant, what you said. What does that really mean? <laughs> you know, clean your room. We're checking in the original language. <laughs> See what that means. Like, it means clean your room. So when, when Jesus said, pray that the kingdom of, the will of heaven will be done on earth, like he meant that. It was like, clean your room. Well, what did he really mean? He meant, <laughs> bring the power and authority from heaven to earth. That's what he meant. Oh. So Ephesians 2, 6 says this. It's talking about God the Father, right? So we have the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about all three of them here in a way. For he, God, God the Father, but we also know it's the, the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. For he, God, raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Okay, break this down a little bit. Here's one of the reasons people relegate things to like future, like either the rapture or when they die, because they misinterpret what this says. It says, for he raised us from the dead. So we read that like, well, I haven't died yet, so this is an, obviously in the future. Because I haven't died. I haven't died, so when I die, this is all going to happen. But since I haven't died, it hasn't happened. Uh, newsflash, you were born dead. Spiritually. You are not born connected to, to God. I mean, God loves you. He does. And, and he's, he's very involved in your life, but you were not born saved. <laughs> You're born into a, world, a fallen world of sin, and you need to come to a place where you, you recognize you need a Savior, and you come to Jesus, right? Salvation, being born again, conversion, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> that, so we're, the Bible says, basically, that we pass from death to life. So we're basically born dead, spiritually dead. But because we have flesh and a beating heart, we think, well, I'm alive. It's like, well, yeah, for a while. But without Christ, you're dead. So, so we're born dead, and, and we need Jesus um, to make us alive. And so, so this is not future. This is now. So we, are you raised from the dead? Yes, you are. Because when you physically die... For you, when you physically die, it, I imagine, I've heard it mentioned this way, it's kind of like stepping out of one pair of shoes into another. Like that transition for you is going to be a lot easier than, than the transition for everybody that's left here. Right? Because you're stepping in, into the presence of, of God. I, I remember going to my Uncle Ben's funeral. He's part of this family. Uh, he was an Assemblies of God pastor for a lot of years. And, and actually, God called me to be a pastor like just a few days after he died. It's kind of interesting, but whatever. Uh, so we were, um, a lot of our family were out in, in uh, Portland area for his funeral, tw I don't know, 18, 19 years ago. Been quite a while. And uh, I don't remember the song, and I should ask my Aunt Shirley what the song is, but her, uh, 
Ben's, my uncle Ben's daughter, my cousin Pam, sang a song. I don't know what the name of it is. I can't hum the melody. I can't even tell you the exact words, but the, basically the song was something like this. The words of the song were something like, I want to live so close to Jesus, like here and now, that when I die, it's like no big change. I mean, obviously it's going to be a big change, right? But like what that song says, and it just gripped my heart, like, I want to live so close to God in such unity with him and, and such a mindset of that, that when I die, it's like, oh, yeah, here I am. Instead of like, whoa, where am I and what happened? Again, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I also kind of identify with the, the song I can only imagine, you know, what it will be like when I walk by. So, like, so, like, it's, it's all easy for me to say, because I've not made that transition yet. Oh, I think it's like stepping out of one pair of shoes and the other. Maybe it's not. I don't know. All I know is I want to live. I want to be like my Uncle Ben, too. I want to live so close to Jesus that when I physically die and, tra- you know, step out of these shoes into my other shoes, right, that, it, that I'm so close to, to Christ that it's like, yeah, yeah, how's it going, right? Um, it just, just, just meant a lot to me. But we're supposed to be in that unity. John 14, Jesus talks about, he says, actually he says these words. He says, uh, you're in me and I'm in you. Jesus said that. So we're in, as a believer, you're in him and he's in you. Okay, if you're in Jesus, where did the Bible, where did we read earlier? Where is, where is Jesus seated? In heaven, right hand of the Father. He's seated in the heavenlies. So if you're in Jesus and you're a citizen of heaven, I know you're seated here, right? This is our earthly view. I'm seated here. I can feel it. Thank God for the air conditioning. Feel it. We're good. But you have to have a mindset. Wait, I'm seated in the heavenlies because I'm in Christ I'm not trying to get weird about it. You understand what I'm saying? Don't, don't push this further than it needs to go. But you, if you're in Christ, you're seated in the heavenly, spiritually speaking. Right? Like, well, I'm not there yet. Right. I know you're not. And like, if I totally understood this a lot better, I could probably explain it a lot better. I'm just like, I'm kind of working through this too. Right? I tell people when you come, like, does your pastor feed you? I'll say, I'm, you're eating what I'm eating. Okay? So, but, we're, but there, there's this, what I'm trying to say is there's, there's this, there is this truth because we are citizens of heaven. We're seated in the heavenlies because Jesus is seated in the heavenlies and we're in him. Right? I know we're here. This is where we're operating, but we need to operate with a heavenly mindset, not an earthly mindset. And we need to operate from heaven to earth, not the other way around. I think so many Christians, because they don't understand we're seated in the heavenlies, they don't understand they are currently a citizen of heaven, we're just like throwing up prayer salvos, hoping something will bump something loose in heaven. Right? I mean, if we're really serious prayers, and sometimes we give up praying like, oh, I don't know if my prayers will make it up there. See, when we... (laughs) When we think about that, it's like we're, think, we're thinking from an earthly mindset. It's like, no, I'm, I'm seated in the heavenlies. I'm in Jesus. He's in me. He's there. I'm not working from the earth towards heaven. I'm working from heaven towards earth. And when I say I'm working, you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, which is what we read earlier in Colossians. So it's the power of Christ working from heaven to earth. Do you get that? Because I think we get the flow backwards in our thinking as Christians. We're so used to doing that. It's like, Jesus, <laughs> see this spot? Help. Right? That's, what do you want me to do here? So here's number three. When we live with a kingdom mindset, this is the last one, we live in peace and joy. <laughs> Oh, I know there's a lot of Christians who don't live in peace and joy. Why? Don't have a kingdom mindset. Focused on, focused on earthly things. Now, let me say this because I understand. As Christians, we have tough days. I mean, the Bible says you're going to have some hard days, right? Uh, but but, Jesus, but uh, Jesus said, I've overcome the world. Yeah, so we're okay. 
we're going to have hard days, but, but when we persevere, it says it gives us character, and character gives us hope, and hope doesn't disappoint. So we do have tough days. I understand that. And there, there, I think there's some sort of kind of branch of Christianity that says, if you're having a bad day, you don't have enough faith. <laughs> I was like, I don't, that's not in the Bible, right? Jesus had some tough days. <laughs> right? So we have tough days, but we'll get through it. But when you have those tough days, where's your head? Where's your head? It's like Jesus, when he was having the toughest day of his life, the Garden of Gethsemane, well, the second toughest day, <laughs> like the day before he died, second toughest day, I'm guessing, I don't know. Uh, and he's praying, oh, Father, if there's any way that this cup could pass. Like, if you got a plan B, Father, now would be a good time to let us know. And he said, but then he said, nevertheless, your will, not mine. Because why? Because he had the heavenly mindset not an earthly mindset. Earthly mindset would say, uh, let's figure something else out. Like, but no, he didn't do that because he had the heavenly mindset. So, but we can generally live in an atmosphere of peace and joy, even in the midst of trials, even in the midst of uh, when we're trying to persevere through certain things. And so, how can I say that? Well, I can say it because the Bible says it in Romans 14, 17. It says, for the kingdom of God, is the kingdom of, here, uh, kingdom of God here now? Yes. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We talked about this verse last week when we talked about uh, our study in Colossians, about kind of the legalism. In, like uh, Paul said, don't let anybody, you know, make you talk about new moons and feasts and you have to do this and can't do this. And so what Paul's saying here in Romans 14, 17, he says, Christianity, the, the, the true Christianity, the kingdom of heaven is not about all the rules and regulations. It's about righteousness through Christ, not your own righteousness, but righteousness that we have through Christ. And it's about peace and joy. Well, peace and joy, what do you know about that? I know that Galatians 5 says it's a fruit of the Spirit. So you, it, it's hard for us to try and manufacture peace and joy, and the world's really working hard to do that. It'll never happen. Peace and joy comes from the Holy Spirit. Okay, so, so how do you have that? You have to yield to the Holy Spirit. When you yield to the Holy Spirit, what are you doing? You have a kingdom mindset, right? You're not focusing on the earthly things, and I do that. I mean, I get, I, I get off the path... At, uh, I was going to say on a daily basis, maybe an hourly basis, maybe minute by minute, but there's times in my day when I'm not experiencing peace and joy, and I realize I'm, I'm not <laughs> enjoying the fruit of the Spirit. I'm focusing on earthly things. Now, I have to be concerned with earthly things, but I don't have to focus there. I, I, I lose my focus on, on spiritual things and the, and the realities of heaven and the truth of heaven and the power and authority that, that God gave us uh, that, that, that flows through us. I, I've said this before. I, we work so hard, we th wrongly work hard to have the fruit of the Spirit. Like, I got to work on my I got to work on my love. I got to work on my kindness. I got to work on my gentleness. You know, there's nine fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians 5. And what I realize is that when you, when you walk in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, and you're yielded to the Holy Spirit, and you have that, you're thinking of spiritual things, fruit happens. Right? You don't, you don't make spiritual fruit happen. It, it happens as a byproduct of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so I said, wouldn't it be great to have a bumper sticker that said, fruit happens I said that a few weeks ago, and a couple of weeks, well, about maybe a couple months ago, actually. A couple of weeks ago, Jennifer uh, Peace hands me an envelope, and I open it up. It's a bumper sticker that says, Fruit Happens. So, it's on the back of my pickup. Check it out. But. Sterling and Mabel DePrato lived in an atmosphere of peace and joy. That was really attractive to me. I didn't realize, I mean, it was attractive. I didn't realize why I was attracted to them. I thought I was attracted to them because they're my grandparents, which I would have been. Even if they would have not had peace and joy, 
they're still my grandma and grandpa and I would have loved them and they love me and we're, we're good. But I'm not realizing until later in life that one of the things that made me so attracted to Sterling and Mabel DePrado, my grandparents, is because they lived in an atmosphere of peace and joy. Why? Because they thought of heavenly things. They weren't all focused on earthly things. If they were focused on earthly things, that house would still be standing. It was an old house. It was an old... It was an old machine truck repair shop they remodeled into a house, and I loved it, but it was, when it was tore down, it needed to be tore down. You know what I'm saying? So here I am talking about a couple that left this earth with not a lot of possessions, but here yet, here I'm talking about them, about one of the most significant moments of spiritual transformation in my life that they did. That they didn't even know about it, just how they lived. It wasn't like my grandpa was going to pull me aside and say, Mike, I want, to, I want to give you a piece of advice here that will form you spiritually and will help you for the rest of your life. No, he was just living life. You know what I'm saying? Just in his everyday life, it's like, I want that. I want that mindset. I want that peace and joy. I want to have that. So, how did they have that? Head was in the right place. Grandma and grandpa's head was in the right place. Their thoughts were in the right place. Their thinking was renewed. Their mind was renewed. Yes, they took care of earthly things. Yes, they lived on this earth, but they had a spiritual mindset that forever has impacted me and will continue to impact me, and I hope it impacts my family. Worship team, if you want to close, come up as we close this morning. It gets a question to think about is, is when life knocks on your door in the dark of night and you open the door and there's financial, hard financial issues, where's your head? When there's a knock on the door of, of poor health, where's your head? When there's a knock on the door of relations that have gone, relationships that have gone south, where's your head? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of circumstances in our world that can really steal our focus, right? And can and can consume our thinking. And I'm not saying we don't have to handle those things. We have to ha- we have to. We don't handle them, but you understand what I'm saying? We have to deal with them. We have to live in that, but we don't have to live in it, right? We can live above that. We can live in an atmosphere of peace and joy, but our head's got to be in the right place. So you've got to be thinking ahead of the, ahead of the game. You've got to be thinking, and I'm not trying to say, oh, it's, it's coming. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying when life knocks and, the, and there's nothing, and the and your guest at the door is not somebody you want, where's your head? Because you've got a purpose in your heart and mind. you got to renew your thinking. How, where's my head going to go when that happens? Because our default mode is to go earthly. But Paul says in Colossians, no, don't go there. Think of things above. Remember where you're seated. Remember you're a citizen of heaven. Remember that you're in Jesus and he's in you and he's at the right hand of God the Father. And he said, when you pray, you pray that the kingdom of heaven, the will of heaven would come to earth. And that's how we're going to pray. I hope that's an encouragement for you today. Some of you might be going through something like that right now. And right now today, you can can get your head in the game because the game's not over. Right? If you got a pulse, game's not over. So you can get your head in the game. For those of you... uh, that life is actually pretty good right now, just just be ready. If something knocks, like my head's not going to go there. Like, well, how, how will I do that? Well, I can't help you do that. Only the Holy Spirit can help you do that. Right? The Holy Spirit will help you do that. So why don't you, if you're physically able, why don't you stand? And we just want to just pray. 
that the Holy Spirit would renew our mind, help us to think different so that when we're confronted, when that door knocks and we open the door, that we keep our head in the right place. Holy Spirit, you know our heart and our heart is to be kingdom minded. Our heart, our desire is to have a kingdom mindset, but yet our default mode is to to think of earthly things all the time. Holy Spirit, help us to renew our mind. Remind us when we're going earthly. Help us to think heavenly. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for the fruit that you produce in our lives when we yield to you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, all that stuff. Thank you for the fruit that happens in our life when we're yielded to you. So Lord, we just ask you today to remind us to keep our head in the game. Think of heavenly things and not always of earthly things. We ask this in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, as we close this morning, we're going to have our prayer time people come up. And maybe you're going through one of those times. Maybe life is knocked. And you open the door and there's financial hardship or pressures or there's health issues that are serious. Or maybe just something you want dealt with. Maybe not so serious. Maybe there's relational issues in your family or in your friends or your workplace that, that needs some healing. I don't know, whatever you need. We, we have these prayer time people here who are here to pray for you confidentially and confidently. And they know that we're praying from heaven to earth. And so the Bible says the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective, and we believe that. So as we uh, close out with this song, which is really a rally cry, build your kingdom here. Build your kingdom here. As we sing that, uh, if you want prayer, come on up, and they'd be glad to pray for you.